Welcome to the Level Up Artist Podcast. We are your hosts, Adriana May and Jackie Sanders. We are two art professionals sharing forward the advice and business lessons we have learned along our creative journeys. We talk to artists, leaders, and art professionals to demystify the creative process and discover new ways to succeed as a career-minded artist. If you find value in these conversations, please go ahead and subscribe. This will help other creatives like you find our podcast and you'll be notified when we drop a new episode every Tuesday. So on today's episode, we're going to be talking about a somewhat serious and important topic, um, artist contracts. So uh, it's one of those things of, you know, do I really need it? It kind of feels intimidating at times, but what if the person is my friend or family member? What if it seems like a really awesome, you know, collector person that we just met? Do we have to have it? Do we really have to go through the process of a contract? I don't know. Yeah. It's a little, <laughs> and they can be super, super intimidating for some artists. I know, especially I was intimidated by them when I was early on in my creative journey, establishing my business. Um, but really reframing how we think about contracts we've learned is super, super important because realistically, the point of having to have a contract is to protect both you and the collector, both you and the client, because contracts establish the terms and conditions for your business. They establish how you want to be um, talked to. They decide the details of a project. And so both parties are on the same page when you enter into an agreement. And it does serve as a safety net if, for whatever reason, something goes different than planned. You already have your ducks in a row and everyone's on the same page on how to move forward. Yep. And I used to work with a lot of contracts or contract related tasks, if you will, in my previous corporate life. So I would be remiss if I didn't do a quick disclaimer and say (laughs) that we are both speaking from our own business experiences. However, we encourage you to seek legal profession, a legal professional to give you advice on the laws and regulations applicable to your business. So we cannot give you legal advice. We can just tell you the things we found what's worked for us and what hasn't, but like the nitty gritty of that, you know, the legalese, if you will, that's written in the contract itself. Um, There's plenty of services out there that you can check out to have, you know, templates and whatnot, or speak to a person about it. So that disclaimer out of the way, (laughs) um, think of a contract, like Jackie said, it's a way to protect you if say the collector or the client wants to back out an agreement Um, it's basically when, you know, you come to a crossroads and you go, but I thought this, but I thought that, um, or perhaps the client's just kind of like backtracking a little bit. That's when you can come out and say, as per the terms of our agreement, dot, 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 whatever that is, but they have it and you have it. You both have copies of, you know, what you both agreed to that you were going to do moving forward. Right. And I think that's the huge benefit that I see with the contract because it really does serve as that framework for those potentially awkward, potentially super tough conversations. If for whatever reason, one or both parties is not holding up their end of the bargain. But another benefit that I found, especially as I was doing the first handful of contracts or maybe working with art collectors that have never been part of an artist contract before, it can also serve as a tool to bring up points of conversation with the other party um, so that you can be upfront about topics, manage expectations, and make sure everyone's on the same page. Because especially if they are a new collector, they might not be familiar with the process that they're agreeing to. And we'll talk about different types of contracts here in a second, but it really does make everyone's life easier because you're basically laying out the roadmap. And there's a lot of things that may be assumed on one party's side or the other, but this makes sure that nothing's assumed, everything is laid out and really seeing a contract as an education form for this is what you can expect from me. This is what I expect from you. Let's move forward. Yeah. And it's interesting because if you think about it, some people might say, oh, but I'm not that familiar with contracts. Why do I even have to deal with one? If you've ever had a regular, even retail nine to five job, it doesn't matter. You sign an employment contract. You know, you're basically saying, this is what I'm going to do. And these are the roles I'm willing to fulfill in exchange for pay. 
right? right? So when you think about it as an artist, you're basically doing the same thing. Um, and thinking of it as a way of, okay, if you're signing a contract that you will do a service and you'll get paid for it, chances are you're going to honor that contract. So you don't really mind having one because say you do have an employer and they don't pay you. Well, you have a contract to look at and go, um, hello, you gotta <laughs> pay me. These services. <laughs> so, uh, you got to pay me. So it's the same way, you know, and anyone who's willing to honor a contract shouldn't mind having one. So not only that, as an artist, they're not going to be like, oh, you're, you know, splitting around as a butterfly and you have no idea what's going on. They're more likely to respect you as a serious business owner when you say, let's put this in black and white and let's get some signatures on this thing. And if they are actually unwilling to sign a contract, red flag, by the way, I mean, yeah, they'd be more likely to break it. Caveat here, the exception here is if you are dealing with a person who has a legal background and they don't want to sign it. It might be because they're wanting revisions or they have other terms and conditions of their own they want to discuss. But outside of that tiny, tiny little <laughs> exception, most everyone else should be willing to sign it, of course, if they have questions about it or there's anything that they want to change about it, then hopefully they are reading it um, and you can go through it. How much detail you go into it, it's obviously up to you in the, I guess you could say, how sophisticated your client is or how involved they are. But essentially you do want to lay it open as here it is. Here are my terms and conditions. You're not going to ask them, what do you think? What do you want to change? No, you just basically, this is it. But do know that if they are asking to make a change, just like you're asking them to honor it, it also comes in with that, you know, you should be willing to also listen to their side of it. And if there's anything about it that, um, maybe makes them uncomfortable. It could be a deal breaker and you just kind of, you work it out. I mean, that's the whole idea behind a contract. It's you lay it out there. Hopefully they sign it. Everything's good. But if not, you just work through it. It's, it's fine. That's what it's there for. Right. And that's the thing. It really does serve as that opening of a conversation. And as with any contracts, communication and managing those expectations up front is really the key to a healthy and smooth process. And frankly, if they do want to change an element of the contract, it's good that you're able to have that conversation before the project even starts, before artwork leaves your studio and goes into their hands, because this is not necessarily something that you want to um, have a discussion about three months into a four month project where there's a lot more to lose on the line. So as your business grows and evolves, inevitably, so will your contracts. You'll have to be revised accordingly based on You'll try to have every situational, if this happens, then what happens here? Um, and you can look up hypotheticals. But overall, as you have experience, as you get more niche into certain contracts, they will change and evolve. So also as a disclaimer, make sure you also set time, set time aside in your business to go back on your contracts, update them, or curate them for specific projects. But with that, let's start talking about what types of projects would you need contracts for? Because depending on where you are in your business, you may be working large scale, you may be working on little pieces, maybe working with galleries and businesses, or maybe it's one-on-one -on -one with a collector. But in any of these situations, there are different contracts that you will need. So everything from long-term projects to exhibiting your work in a space, whether it's private, public, or in a corporate space. Maybe people want to rent your artwork for a set amount of time um, or commission pieces. This is a super common one for artists. If someone's commissioning you to make a specific piece of artwork or a piece in your style based on their room or a different scale, these are all situations in which you would need a contract in place. Yeah. And you can also think of it as a contract as, or a need for a contract when you are having an exchange of money that's happening between two parties for products or services that have yet to be fully rendered right so like you said it could be a commission um or it could be even something like you know they're asking can you create this on my behalf and design it you haven't done it yet but you're saying hey give me part of that money up front and then the rest later but there's still there's still things going on, right? It's not a one and done type situation. So someone comes to my studio and buys a painting off the wall. There is no contract. Like that's it. We're done. <laughs> like, <laughs> have a nice day. Load um, it in your car, take it home. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. 
but for anything extended, yeah, you definitely want to consider it. And just think of it too, like if you are creating something at the bequest of another person, or you are placing the artwork in the care of somebody else, you want a contract to protect both parties. But as it relates to you, the artist, if something happens to that art, like how are you going to proceed? What are they agreeing to do? Um, a quick example of that, for example, some institutions, when you sign a contract and they have your work on exhibit, if something happens to it, and say it's an institution that would have given you 50% commission. Some of them, what we'll do is if the piece gets destroyed, they'll give you that 50% commission you would have received if it had sold. So on their end, they're basically writing it off insurance wise. And from your end, you're still getting what you would have gotten, even if it had sold, which in this case, it could have been that it got stolen or destroyed. But those kind of things are things you will find in the terms and conditions of a contract. And before you sign any of them, whether you're the one providing it or you're receiving one, you definitely want to look at that kind of information and see what, what you're agreeing to. Exactly. And with each of these types of projects, you will need different types of contracts. There'll be different factors that you have to consider, different what if scenarios that you have to take into account and kind of give the timeline and action plan for what would happen if this happened or if that happened. So today we're going to go over four main types that we've identified as artists. These are probably the four most common, but again, there are several different types, different modifications, um, but we're going to do a brief overview in case you are brand new to contracts about the main four that we have seen. So the first being project proposals, second being exhibition honorariums, third commission contracts, and fourth, a payment plan agreement. So the first one on our list, project proposals, you can think of this as being a document that the artist puts forth to a prospect client um, where you want to kind of get the ball rolling. And a lot of times this is not a standalone. It's often going to come accompanied or almost a hybrid of other types of contracts that we're going to cover. But essentially what you're doing is you're pitching a project idea. You know, you have design sketches, the concept of your work, whether this is triggered by an open call or not, um, they come in different flavors. So sometimes it might be like, say you are a mural artist, you see a wall and you're like, ooh, I'd love to paint that. You put something together, you find out who the business owner is or who owns that wall and say, I have this awesome mural idea here's my, you know, here's what I envision it would look like. And here's how much money I would need to complete it. Right. Um, so you review it with a client, let's say they agree to move forward. And that's when you send the more formal contract afterwards, where you can look at different lengths of time based on the size of the project and the document itself too. Um, and essentially they sign and submit a deposit before you start any of the work. Um, which that being said, one small little exception to this is for some artists, like the mural example I just gave, they may actually charge a design fee separately um, just to protect themselves in case the owner of that wall says, yes, I love your idea. Thanks for sending it over. Have a nice day. Never talking to you again. And then hands over that exact sketch to somebody else to do it for cheaper than you. So anyways, 99.9% .9 of everybody you're going to work with is going to be awesome, decent clients. But for that 0.1%, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, that contract's going to help. So there are times where you will um, actually get some payments in advance of them even signing the big contract and starting to work. So there's that. And then um, exhibition honorariums. So corporate spaces, universities, museums, restaurants, all sorts, you know, you're basically putting your space somewhere else and they are paying you a stipend or rent, so to speak, in order to display your work in their space. Um, and I'm a big proponent of if you are talking to a place and they say, I'd love to have your wall, um, you know, your art on our walls and they're not talking about payment. I would be like, so um, <clears throat> maybe we can talk about an honorarium. You don't have to pay me a bundle, but 
at least something. Um, so it's good to familiarize yourself with this type of document in case a place you're looking to display at doesn't have one of these agreements in place and or you want to encourage them to. After all, while that work is in display at their place, not only is it at the risk of being damaged, destroyed, stolen, all the things, right? I mean, it's part of the deal, right? But on top of that, if somebody came to your studio and wanted to buy that art, it's not there. It's somewhere else. Now, that also means someone that sees it at that other location, and that's the whole idea, right? Get more eyeballs into it, could want to purchase. But that's also why you want to have these kind of terms and conditions in place of what happens if you have it, say, in a corporate space and somebody wants to buy it. Do they have to wait till the exhibition's over? Does this change how much rent you get paid for that artwork if it gets taken earlier? Or does that person have to wait till the exhibition time is over to get money? Like, those are all the kinds of things that you're going to cover within that honorarium, as well as who's going to carry the insurance and the risk if something happens to that space, to that, you know, to that piece. So lots to think about, of course, but definitely one you really want to be familiarized with if you're going to be exhibiting at places um, that are not necessarily your studio or in a big established place that already has contract. Right. And again, from like an education standpoint, I think that's a great opportunity in which us as an artist community can educate, um, whether it's a store owner, a restaurant, a corporate building, um, about all these things to consider. Because just as someone who's new to collecting artwork, if a space has never had original artwork in their space, they're not in the art world. They don't think about all these what if scenarios until they may unfortunately happen. And if a painting gets run into and it, there's a huge hole in it and they're like, oh no, what do we do now? Those are all things that are really tough conversations. So us as the artist community, we can educate these business owners on the proper procedures and expectations that we have when displaying our work for their guests and the general public to see. Yeah. And I've heard stories of like artwork actually been <laughs> disappearing. is not the right word, but an artist sending work to a location to have it on display, but there's no contract in place. And this was a slimy business owner. No yeah. better Okay, there are other choice words, but we're going to go with that one. <laughs> um, but essentially, this person said the artwork was lost, which it wasn't. Years later, this is like another podcast I was listening to. Many, many years later, a different artist visits this owner. And in their office was the missing artwork on display. And this was like 10 years later or something ridiculous. So this other artist recognized the artwork of the victim artist and essentially yeah. was like, um, guess what I just found? This person actually didn't lose your work. They kept it. Um, so the original artist, the problem they had was they had no contract. So when the business owner got pressed, they basically said they received it as a gift. Like I said slimy piece of work mm -hmm. slimy um anyway so then they had to go through legal action and oh no because there was nothing in writing this artist didn't even have an inventory nothing nothing showing when it was sent so it was just that kind of mess and again it was missing for like 10 years eventually they did recover it and they got some payment but only after they had to pay a lawyer to help pursue that course of action so oh, you no know, this is like third party story game of telephone version of it, but you get the gist of it. You don't want to put artwork somewhere and then it disappears and you have not even a piece of paper to say, Hey, you said I could get it back by this day and get paid or not, but that these are the terms and conditions and yeah. Cover your ass. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh man. That's a crazy story. And, yeah, I and I feel like both of those are very similar in that um, it's you having existing artwork on display in different places. But another super common contract are commission contracts. So this is where you're actually making an original piece of art or hosting an, an original um, project or an event for a company or an individual. And so this is where you're actually making something specifically for a situation or a person. So a commission contract, basically the workflow goes, you decide on the details, you both agree on the concept, the design, sketches, 
scope of work, the timeline, you send the contract over, they sign it and submit ideally a deposit. Um, so some of your front end costs can be covered. You work on the project and then execute the agreed upon timeline. A lot of the time, these commission contracts do have a lot more details in terms of deadlines. Okay, on this date, I will send you this. By this day, this will be done. And includes a lot of those what if scenarios um, that we always think about as artists, kind of thinking about everything you could think that could like possibly go wrong, having your contract as oh, well, if this is a situation, this is what we're going to do about it. What happens if you send them a sketch halfway through you doing a painting and they absolutely hate it? <laughs> do they get their money back? Do they get to reallocate that money towards a different piece? Will you start from ground zero or will there be an added cost for starting from ground zero? What happens if they get to the end and they decide, oh, I actually want four more paintings because I love this so much. Is there a potential for a discount on future pieces? Do you have like a return collector discount? Um, all these different situations that you have to think about with the actual art making process is part of the commission contract. And especially if it is a larger process or a larger timeline, this may go hand in hand with another type of contract, which is a payment plan contract. So maybe within your commission contract, you say, okay, you need a deposit by this day, halfway through this amount is due. And with the completion of the project, this final amount is due. Um, but with a payment plan contract, those can also apply for a finished piece. So if someone comes into your studio um, or sees a piece on Instagram that you post, and let's say, for example, it costs $2,000. Unless they're able to have $2,000 on cash that they Venmo you or direct deposit to you, that might not be a piece that is feasible for them to purchase. But this is where payment plan contracts can be super, super beneficial, especially for expanding your collector base, because it really makes most pieces affordable for all people. And so you can say, okay, Within six months, you need to pay off this piece. So you as the artist would keep the artwork, but maybe they submit a 10% deposit and then pay 10% of the final price all the way until it's done. Um, and so these details, having the payment plan option, again, is super, super awesome for being able to offer options and financial considerations um, with paying for your piece to more people. And also people are super appreciative and understanding um, of wanting to do a little bit over time. And it is also just an amazing moment when someone finally pays off their full payment plan contract and they come to your studio and pick up your piece after having X amount of money coming out of their bank account every month for the past six months or 10 months or however long the contract is. Um, and be able to pick up their painting and take it home with them. So it's a super awesome option and a win-win for everyone, really. Yeah, and definitely, most definitely, unless it's some, actually, no, not even friends or family, I'll be honest, do not let them take a painting until they're done. Super, yes. super important. Friendships, families, like, will be estranged. You do not want to go down that road. If you have this on display, <laughs> you only gave me a hundred bucks out of 2000. Like, nope, 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 nope. Yeah. And I think that goes back to the idea of like, anyone who would honor a contract doesn't mind having one. Anyone who respects you and your business as a creative entrepreneur um, will respect, okay, yes, you can't pay for, I'm trying to think of another example. You can't say, Hey, Nike, I want to buy these shoes. I'm going to give you 10 bucks and I'm just going to wear them until however long I want. And maybe I'll pay you in the future. Like for all, you know, they can set up automatic payments and then, yeah, I don't know, cancel that credit card and you're just out of luck. So yeah. yes, definitely yeah. agree until they fully pay off their piece. We highly suggest do not let them take the painting. Nope. Nope, nope, no. Nope. Yep. Just imagine. I mean, layaway used to be a thing in stores, which is another way to think about it or another term that you might hear artists talk about, like you can put that painting on layaway. 
Yeah. yeah. No, the store didn't let you take the stuff. You had to pay for it. They literally had a room where they would save the things. And once you were done, we're paying. Ta-da. Now, obviously, that's a bigger conversation we could have at some other point of like what goes into payment plans. But the gist of it is they're giving you an amount up front and then they're paying you. Don't know about six months. That makes me a little nervous. I'll confess much less ten. <laughs> Uh, maybe three months tops. I guess it depends too on the value of the painting and how much they're buying. But definitely yeah. it's up to you, not them. What makes you feel comfortable? What kind of minimum payment you're willing to take? Because this thing is taking up space in your storage. Um, right. Also another point I want to add about the commission part that you mentioned, Jackie, is um, at least from my end, the way I see it is if you're going to make work that's easily sellable to somebody else, and I'm talking mm-hmm. specifically about commissions, I know some artists won't even do a contract or a deposit because in their mind, they are like, well, if this person fails, I'll just sell it to the next one. So that's one mindset. But if you're creating something, say it's a portrait of somebody's grandfather or somebody yeah. very specific to it. Um, in talking to other artists that do like people portraits and pet portraits, They'll generally say 50% up front, hands down. Right. That way if the person flakes out, that 50% not only covers their materials, but also some of their time. Um, right. Obviously cuts into the profit if somebody else, you know, does flake out. But it means that if the person does back out, now you're left with somebody's portrait of their grandparents. Like that's so personal. Who else is going to buy that? Right. Um, happens to look like someone in their family. Chances are that's a loss. So that's another little tidbit, you know, to kind of add in there. Again, 99.9% of everybody you're going to deal with is awesome and great. But that one percent, that little point one can really, really break it a little bit. So, right. And even if it's a, I mean, even if it's not a portrait, even if it is an abstract piece of art that in theory, someone else can enjoy. So if they totally ghost you and stop communication after three months, you say, okay, well, that's fine. I'll sell it to someone else. Well, then what happens if they come back six months from now and ask, Hey, how's my commission going? You're like, well, I haven't heard from you in months, So I sold it. So still having a contract in those situations and having that specified of, okay, at what point of missed communication, do they just void this entire contract and the artwork is up for sale for anyone else. And then what happens to the payments they may have made up to that point? That's also right. the terms and conditions. Cause it could be like, Hey, you ghosted me for three months. I finished the artwork. I tried to contact you. I DM you. I emailed you. I called you, you know, whatever forms of communication. Well, now you're going to avoid both whatever payments you made up until this point. Thank you. Going to call it a service fee. And right. Um, like, yeah. And even being hyper specific in terms of that, I mean, you can say the artist will do their best to contract the collector through phone calls, text message, and email. If after three months of monthly messages, there's still no response, X, Y, Z happens. Like laying it out so crystal clear to make sure you can say, nope, I have the receipts. This is what happened. And sorry, but... We can start a new contract for a new commission, if you would like, with a new deposit. (laughs) Yeah. And then there's also the chance that you created something for them, put your heart and soul into it. It looks exactly like what they agreed to, you know, based on what you discuss. And they go, either they don't like it or they say something happened in my family. I don't have the money for this. I need to. I'm so sorry. I need to back out. That's where the contract's going to help you determine, okay, what happens to the funds at that point and the art itself? Maybe you decide to give them a credit and you say, you know what? I understand things happen or I'm sorry. You didn't like it. I did my best. Um, have out the money that you put in already. We use it as a credit and you buy something else that's already made. Like right. <laughs> at that point, I'm like, if you're already back in, I don't know that I want to do another commission for you, but Hey, there's something ready made on the wall. Would you like to get that instead and right. go better with you and we can work later in the future? And that way it's not like, it doesn't always have to be like a burning bridge situation. Sometimes it's just, you know, stuff happens. Hey, I didn't answer because I don't know, I had, I was in the hospital. You never know right. what it is. So it's also having that flexibility of like, okay, again, 
most most humans are fine most (laughs) it's just for those that aren't that you're protecting yourself for the most part yeah and I think that's the biggest thing as we said earlier in the episode of it really just comes down to communication and managing expectations and I know you and I both in our contracts have explicitly saying that we will do our best in most situations to work with the other party if changes to the contract do need to be made because as you said like if they for whatever reason have a huge shift in their financial um what is extra and so they can't necessarily finish the commission contract they say oh, I'm seven fifty in to a thousand dollar commission. We're not the type of people to be like, well, sorry, you still have to pay me. I know <laughs> you're struggling financially, but I don't care. We have a contract. Like, no, we'll work with you. We'll do our best to make sure everyone's happy. And especially when it comes to payment plans too, as you talked about earlier of doing either like three months or four months or six months, I personally have it very situational. I have a standard that I would like. Yes, ideally three to four months would be the largest that I physically store a piece that no one else can come to my studio and buy. But I know like one of my early collectors um, purchased a large painting and so it was over a thousand dollars, but they were a teacher. And so making huge payments to this painting every week or every two weeks was not feasible. And so working with the client of saying, okay, what is best for them? Um, and being okay with saying, you know what, like, I really can't have you pay $10 every month for the next four years. No, <laughs> can't do that. <laughs> Use a credit but, card at that point, please. Right. Sorry. Being able to work within their means and being understanding, um, is, does go a long way and people remember that kind of stuff. So yeah. it ultimately, as with any human relationship just comes down to communication. Yeah, it does. So just remember. I mean, contracts are a useful and necessary tool for your business. They help keep everyone on the same page. They help establish expectations up front and some of those what if scenarios that we talked about. Um, They protect both you and the client so you can avoid any future misunderstandings. Also, definitely remember that anyone who would honor a contract would not mind signing one. So if you do get any pushback or find yourself questioning, should I have a contract for this? You probably should. And if they do push (laughs) back, you can still move forward with the project, but definitely be on high alert. Make sure that you're being respected, that the collector is being communicated with, and that everyone's expectations up front are managed to bring this piece of artwork or this project or this display to life. Yep. And if you choose not to use the contracts, no judgment, of course. (laughs) Although if there's any legal folks listening, they're probably going to be like, you need a contract. (laughs) (laughs) But with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up today's conversation. And we hope you got a lot out of it this episode. As always, our blog will be linked in the show notes where you can find episode notes and links to our other podcast episodes. If you want to stay connected with us in between episodes and share what you have learned, you can follow us on social media. I'm at Amaya Art across all platforms. And I'm at Jay Sanders Studio on all platforms. And if you want to follow the podcast, we are at Level Up Artists on Instagram. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week.